What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Accounting Flow podcast brought to you by Financial Sense. This podcast is dedicated to taking a deep dive into accounting firm workflow and processes. Each episode, we will spend 20 minutes interviewing actual accounting firm owners just like you, uncovering specific processes that firm owners and operators encounter on a daily basis and discuss ways to improve them. Let's go. All right, it is 2024. Here we are. And in 2024, there's a lot of people who are likely going to be reevaluating how they think about their firms, how they grow their firms, and how they manage them. So today, we get to deep dive on the topic of how do you select a practice management system? How and why is that the core of your firm? And what are some do's and don'ts and things to look out for along the way? What's the process that you should employ uh, to select a practice management system? And on that note, we have Stacy Feldman here to help us navigate this topic. Hey, how are you, Stacey? Greetings. Good morning. I'm doing re- really well. Yeah, topic of 2024, we ourselves went through the whole process of goal planning, figuring out what we want to do for the next year. And a lot of that is systems and softwares and how we want to optimize our workflows. Ooh, so you're already knee deep into this already. You probably started that process in 2023. Um, but from what I understand, you went through this massive analysis to select a, a practice management system in 2023. Um, before we get into that, I want to hear the little elevator pitch of who is Stacy, what are you doing, and um, why, are, why are you here talking about this? Sure. Um, Roman, you and I know each other really well. Um, <laughs> my name is Stacey Feldman. I'm the COO partner at Full Send Finance. I work very closely with Roman. Um, and it, my role at Full Send, which at Full Send, we're a finance and accounting firm that services early stage growth companies. Um, but my role is to own the, the operations of the company, find efficiencies, build the softwares, build the team, um, and make sure we're executing on our deliverables to clients in a really strong way. Um, so big part of that is our softwares, our software package, how we're um, doing our work day to day and how we're reducing our reliance on memory and a lot of the work that we're doing. Yeah. And along those lines, as a COO of a very small business, that also means you wear a lot of hats. It's not just, hey, I'm singularly focused on selecting a practice management system and, and running that. You wear a lot of hats. And as we look to grow and scale the business, what we do today and, and how we employ new softwares, new systems, new tools for the business will, will materially impact how we grow and scale tomorrow. So um, when you jumped in and we started evaluating a new practice management system, how, where did you start? How did you start thinking about that and what kind of led you down the path of, hey, this is something that Full Send might need? Sure. I think for us in the way that we are looking at our business, um, we do everything. We make every decision through the lens of scalability. We want to be able to grow our firm to a, you know, four or five times what we are today. And we don't want our systems to hinder us in that process. So as we're thinking about delivering our work, it's will this process that we're doing today serve us if we were 10 times larger, 10 times volume that we're doing in the day to day today. So it was really clear early on. I mean, we're new company startup. It's very clear that we wanted a system or something to track our overall workflows that we're delivering to clients. Um, and the scalability is very important because we are a startup and today we had you know very few clients. So it, it was a lot easier to rely on memory or you know, save documents in a different location. Um, but we're really trying to emphasize the approach of the scalability to start making our, our muscle memory be in the, in the format of the future. Um, so, you know, it was just really clear that we don't have a scalable process using Google docs and Excel and one client's this way, this client's that way, kind of doing things in different, (laughs) different workflows isn't scalable. So, um, we take the approach of, Let's find a a good way to build this infrastructure from the get go and then grow it from there. One of my favorite quotes that goes so beautifully with what you just articulated is from DJ Patil, who is the chief data scientist under the Obama administration. And and his quote goes something to the effect of build for 1x, 
prototype for 10x and engineer for 100x. And what you're alluding to here is engineering for that 100x of are the things we're doing today going to serve us well in the future? And knowing that there's a lot of change that occurs during that scaling process, like that's how you're thinking about the business. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, if we want to just dive into that overall process of how you think about even ideating around a new software, the first step in that is understanding how you do what you do today. Um, and it doesn't have to be a super formal process. I mean, it depends if you're a small company or a larger enterprise. I think these steps are still really valuable. Um, but it's it's mapping your workflows, figuring out how things are done, what steps are taken today. Um, that way you can you know identify pain points, figure out where things are sticky, where things tasks are duplicated, where you have inefficiencies. Because this is the first step in really figuring out what you need to solve for. If you don't map what map out where you are today, you'll never know what you need for tomorrow. So it's, yeah. I can't understate or overstate this, this point enough that documenting and I, itemizing out what you're doing today is the most important step in selecting a new software to solve for the problems. You, you know, it's interesting. We This is the second time that this has come up. Uh, we had a conversation with Corey Knoyer uh, about a month or two ago uh, as it relates to automation. And he also said the first step of looking at automation is to process map. And so you're alluding to this very similar process that you went through to document and map out how the firm is operating. Now, how did you tactically do that? Were you utilizing a tool or were you visualizing it? Were you using Google Sheets? You know, what what was your way of approaching mapping? Yeah, I know a lot of people love workflow process docs, you know, squares and triangles <clears throat> and arrows. I My brain works in lists. So I, you know, I had a Google Doc and I said, when we're doing scoping, these are the softwares we're using. And this then flows into our actual service document. And what softwares are we using to service different steps in the process. Um, and through that, you can see, okay, here we're using, you know, practice ignition for scoping, but then we're moving into Google Sheets, and then we're using our email, and then we're using Excel for some clients. So you can really visualize to whichever way is better for your brain, how things are flowing, how information is shared. Um, and you can see a lot of the the inefficiencies, right? If you have the final client deliverables for an accounting firm or to somehow share the financials with your client. Well, are you doing that in the work in one software and then going back to your email and manually going through and, and sending, consolidating that information and sending it? How much time is that taking? Is it a big pain point? That could be an area that you could automate through a software. And what's interesting about this is that everybody's brain works differently. Your brain works in lists. Mine works in shapes and colorful uh, lines and all these types of things. But one hot tip that can be utilized by anybody that has access to chat GPT is go for a walk, turn on the ability to speak to chat GPT through your phone, download the app, and then just talk through your process. Just talk through every step, you know, maybe break it up into chunks. Here's your onboarding, here's your client monthly delivery, and then ask ChatGPT to summarize that back to you and organize it in a, in a manner that's more conducive to process mapping. That's a really good way to do that without having to tactically go in and type out lists and lists and things of that nature. Um, that's so you a had your really good suggestion. Yeah, I like that suggestion. Yeah, it's just hard for me. It's hard for me to like tactically to list out every single thing. Exactly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So now that you have your list, was that uh, an intent to identify pain points or just get it out on paper so you could kind of visually see it? Well, I mean, it's one and the same, right? You're documenting so you can see what your process is. But in that process, you're seeing, okay, where are things sticky? Where can things be automated? Where am I doing the same thing in multiple different places? Uh, where do I have to rely on memory for certain tasks? Um, so depending how your brain works, you can start to see trends and see um, just where things can be improved. And that and that feeds in then to the next step, which is defining what you can solve for and defining the objectives that you would want to solve for through a practice management or an operation system for your business. And so did you go through kind of a stack ranking of, you know, here's what I can solve for, here's the pain point, and then say, 
I, I can solve this one pain and it will have a ripple effect to solve other pains that exist. Did you prioritize in, in that way and then ultimately land on, hey, we need a new practice management system? <laughs> I think I already kind of knew <clears throat> that we needed a software. We, I knew we, we weren't going to scale to where we needed to be and doing month and closes in Excel or Google Docs. So I already knew that just based on conversations with other industry leaders and how they're managing workflows, that it was something we wanted. So I already kind of checked that box. Now the next step was like, okay, what features do we want in a practice management system? Or what objectives do we want to solve for based on the pain points that we have today? Every business is different. Everyone's serving their clients in a different way. Um, but for us, what I did visually, because I'm a list grid person, um, is I had the, our key features or I guess objectives we wanted to solve for. And I can, I can pull this up here, what I actually wrote down as I found the document. Um, so one of the primary items was price um, and different softwares price different features in different ways. So I kind of said, what would our price be if we served 60 clients with 10 employees? And what would it be if we served 300 clients with 50 employees? Just so I could get a sense of what the, mm. how the price would change as we scale. Um, what integrations does the software provide? The integrations are really important in our line of business of automating different workflows. So I wanted to get a good sense of what <clears throat> are native with certain providers. And then the features was a big thing. Um, integrated email, team collaboration tools, automation, um, budget, actual reporting, uncategorized expense reconciliation, uh, client access, document share, the list can, is almost limitless of different features, but this is the one piece that for features specifically that you can tie them back to your pain points. What in your workflow do you want to solve for that you need for your system to have for you to scale your business? I think for us, um, some of the main items were workflow automation, um, which means, and when I say workflow automation, I guess one of the main things was creating a workflow task list per client and having that automate and recur each month. Having, not having to kind of duplicate what needs to be done. Again, it's, it's eliminating the reliance on memory. What, need, what specific tasks need to be done? Having that auto recur so we're not messing with the actual tasks that need to happen mm -hmm. each, each month for each client. Um, I also wanted some sort of client communication hub. We at our firm, we found out or we realized through that mapping that we're communicating with clients and having them access different portals in different ways. And we wanted to, to condense that down into one or two primary communication paths, primary being email and then one secondary platform. So what we had, we, we realized, oh, our clients are required to log into four different systems and have passwords. And in this system, they're doing their bank accounts uh, right, uh, connection. In this system, they're getting their budget to actual. And in this system, they're getting just uncategorized expense questions. So uh, let's consolidate that down into one primary software. And you know, again, through that workflow visualization, we could see like we need to solve for this too many access points. Um, so that was one primary feature that was very important for us to have in the practice management software. Um, it, yeah, and there's plenty more. I mean, time tracking can be one if you want to measure capacity. Um, we don't bill hourly, but we do like to see profit or um, just margin by client. Um, so things like that are, are, were really important for us. And so knowing that there are many, many uh, features, items that can bubble up through this type of exploratory process, you, what's interesting to me is that you led with price. Price was the first thing that you mentioned. Now, I'm curious, did your perspective on price change when you then identified what types of features could solve your problems more easily, more naturally, or be integrated in a better manner? Did you then kind of revisit that and say, okay, well, I'm willing to pay a little bit more here because of this access? Or how, how did that change as you kind of went through this, this process? For me as a visual like grid person, what I was able to do is to see that most of these systems and softwares provide like a core service or core offering that they all kind of solve for certain problems. But when you have the price also next to these different uh, features that they provide, you can pull outliers in out like that, right? You can see whether you know, there, there was one software, for example, that was 
five times the price of all of the others that were in our list. And the features didn't solve for many other problems that we really mm-hmm. identified in our in our workflow. So we were easily able to just like nix that software that's not worth our time to really explore or test or really do a demo of. Um, I, I say price was there just because I am a numbers focused person. Um, you know, when we get into the do's and don'ts, one of the don'ts is select based on price. So I, I think it just happened that the price was the first kind of feature that I was looking at in the, in the grid. Yeah. Okay. So don't select a system based on price. Do map out your process and understand where the pain points are. One of the challenges that I found throughout a process of selecting a firm, uh, a firm management system, practice management system is, is that I, I get so, um, maybe enamored by different uh, features that exist that may may not contribute to the core as much as they should or as much as I think they do. Um, but I tend to look at these lists of features and say, oh, well, this tool has that option, this tool has that option, and just kind of get attached to that um, without really understanding all right, what is the core functionality that is required to create a better experience for clients? Because that's the second point that I heard you say is, how does this relate to a better client experience? Can you kind of expand on on that a little bit, just enamored by features and also how does this improve client outcomes? Sure, yes. I mean, so what I said for point one was, you know, figure out your workflows. Point two is define your objectives. Point three is engage your stakeholders. Who's going to be using your software day in and day out? Who's going to be actually going through and setting up tasks and and really executing on this different software and, and delivering to clients through the platform? You need to make sure those people can easily use this software, right? If you have a, a, a software with all the bells and whistles, but it's just clunky and difficult to adopt at your stage in the business, maybe you don't have an IT team to set up all the back end, or you don't have the time to build the infrastructure that's required to make things easy and automated. You need to take that into consideration when you're selecting the software. How easy is it to be to use? It, it needs to be user friendly, right? I mean, for us, when we, like we had a system that we were using to just kind of centralize client information um but it was just it just felt like there was a hurdle to using it every day and it was very clear when we found you know tested different softwares that the one we ultimately landed on it was just easy right it was easy to use it it actually solved for the pain points that we had and the inefficiencies that we identified earlier in the process and so now I'm hearing there's a divergence between the quantitative and the qualitative analysis of this process of saying quantitatively, there are these features that really directly solve our pain points. Qualitatively, it has to be a system that I like, that the team enjoys using, that they will use, and that really makes sense for us to adopt. And so mm-hmm. were there other qualitative things that you were evaluating alongside of ease of use? Sure. Um this kind of goes in the don't category of when you're selecting, you cannot ignore vendor reputation, right? When you're doing your research and looking at different platforms, what are people saying about the software, whether that's online and reviews or just in your network and having conversations with different firms that are on the platform, the people who are using it, do they like it? Do they feel like they don't have the support they need? You know, those conversations are important and you cannot ignore uh, just what people are saying about the platform Um, and also not ignoring tech trends and how quickly the software provider is adopting them, Mm -hmm. right? Our industry is moving very fast with AI and and different automations that are available to us. Is your provider, is this software on top of that? Are they finding ways to improve the software based on user needs or are they fairly stagnant where this is their offering and they're not really modifying it based on industry trends? Um, you can find that out quickly as well. Just online user reviews, go on Reddit, check out what people are saying. If people don't like something, you will be able to find it. (laughs) It, It's such a good point because I, I think about online reviews and how to qualitatively assess whether or not this is a good system, whether or not it has a good reputation. I think about how and when people actually take the time to review something that they experience in their life. Um, My home builder for this home that we built had terrible reviews. 
And then I looked at other home builders and they were all terrible. And then I realized <laughs> the only time that anybody actually takes time to review a home builder is when they have a poor experience. So I think that a lot of the like online review stuff can be really, mis it can be misleading. And so we approached the qualitative assessment of, is this a good system by, uh, having conversations at conferences, by having smaller group discussions with our peers and other firm owners, and then having one-on-one -on -one discussions with other firm owners who either utilize the systems that we were exploring or had had experience onboarding maybe one or multiple systems. And that was really validating. Yeah. And we were really lucky in that we started from basically infancy at our firm, right? This process of a selecting a new system can be a lot harder if you need to manage the change management from an existing software to a new mm -hmm. platform. Um, and that's why it's really important to, to not underestimate the training requirements around this, right? What, what does your team need to learn to be successful mm -hmm. in this new software? And how supportive is the software provider in guiding your team through that process? Do they have packages or even just support that um, has training for your team that can help them, you know, ask questions and figure out how they can best use the software. It's another kind of qualitative aspect of making sure you're, you're on the right path. I think that's a great question to ask for anybody exploring and particularly a new practice management software is ask the, the sales rep, the AE, whoever you're talking to within the organization, ask them, what does onboarding look like and how do you play a role in the success of my firm onboarding your tool? And when you go through that process, you'll understand very quickly, like how they approach that if they have a process, um, because you can cobble together an onboarding yourself, or you can work alongside of them. And I, I generally would tend to say, hey, work alongside of the team, uh, particularly if it's this important of a system, work alongside the team, pay a little bit of money to help them onboard you in the most effective manner so that you can get the most out of the system. Um, yeah, I mean, it kind of ties back to the original um, steps I was talking through where like you assess your workflows, you define objectives, engage stakeholders, do the research. But the last one is adopting and committing to the platform, mm. right? You can ask your vendor to help you to guide and train and have that ability. But a lot of that is on internally in the team, right? If you, if you don't have a clear path and plan for actually adopting the software, whether you're starting from scratch or change managing the crossover from an existing platform, you're not going to have a successful implementation. There need to be clear deliverables and process plan around, we're going to start with one client, we're going to test it out, we're going to have, see where the inefficiencies are, and then we're going to have load three more clients on, or you know, every new client at this date is going to be on board into the new platform. There needs to be specific timelines and deadlines around how the new software is going to be hmm. um, rolled out at the, at, the, at the firm, and you need to hold to it. Right. If you don't adopt and commit to the new software, your team is never going to um, go onto that path as well. Right. And it's the same thing for us. Right. We could have implemented our software and then the team could still be reconciling in Excel or kind of using things on, saved on their desktop. But because we're requiring, we're monitoring and we're tracking the use of the system and making sure day to day that people are doing things in the process that we've mapped out we're having a, a more, much more successful implementation and overall usability of the soft, software. Yeah, now you're moving into change management. How do you effectively communicate changes to how you operate internally uh, in order to kind of rally the team and excite them and, and encourage them and help them understand how this will benefit you know, the stakeholder that you're talking about? How do you get their input and their their um, excitement to like jump into this? Because it's never easy. It's always hard sure. to learn a new system. And so I, I really like that connectivity to the team now of let's create a successful outcome for the team because we know that this is going to be a big effort. Yeah, I mean, the best way to do that is to engage the team early, right? Whether that's... Um, selecting a few key stakeholders who are going to have a committee on being involved in the overall assessment, review, and selection of the software, right? You want to have your team involved, making sure their, their needs are heard, right? When we're going through the definition process of figuring out what features are most important, 
you need the team involved. You need to know what their pain points are and what they're struggling with to make sure those are highlighted in the selection process. So what, if the team is engaged from you know the very early on in the process, it's going to feel like less of a of a burden. Where hey team, we found a new software. We're gonna we're gonna onboard it now, right? You want to kind of phase through that. They're involved in the process. They're they're expressing their concerns and their needs, and then they have a say in the overall selection. So if, if there's more transparency in the overall process, it's going to be a heck of a lot easier for the team overall to adopt that change and then start to phase into a new system and process. Totally, totally. And if you have a firm size of you know, maybe sub 10 people, it's a lot easier to communicate, hey, here's what we're exploring, here's how we're doing it, um, here's, here are the the factors that we're assessing to understand what tool makes the most sense, maybe bring in a teammate or two on that front. You know, once you get beyond that, if you have a team of 20 people, you have two internal and 18, you know, client service team members, and, and maybe you have a pod structure and three pods of six people, bring in those pod leaders to allow them to be advocates and, and have input in the process so that then they can disseminate what that change management looks like downward to the rest of the team. Uh, there are a lot of ways that you can do it, but that's maybe one approach that you could take. Yeah. And if you're in your mapping process, you're identifying the appropriate inefficiencies and pain points while the overall migration will be challenging. Your team should fe feel excited about it because it should make their lives easier. <laughs> the software should be easy to use. You know, all of these points we talked about previously, while any software change is going to be a little bit clunky, a little bit uh, burdensome to learn and adopt. The outcome should be ease of use and, and overall making the experience better for your team members. I, it should I never love... be making it harder. It should any software <laughs> should never be making lives harder. Well, it, you're right. I think I do think that there is an element up front where it may be a little bit harder to just to adjust to a new mm -hmm. system, a new means of communication, things like that. But I like how you tie that to the outcome for the stakeholder at you know the uh, accountant level up because ultimately what this tool should enable for that individual and every firm owner has to define this for themselves but hey this may give you more personal freedom this may allow you to be able to spend more time doing the things you love because we are more efficient over here and if that message is hey we could pile more work onto your plate because we're more efficient that <laughs> yeah. may not be the right messaging <laughs> the primary message we used when we were figuring out which software we wanted to use um, is that we wanted a, a platform that documents workflows and process in a way that if a team member wants to take vacation during the heat of month end close, another team member could come in, look at that workflow and complete their work for them. And that's kind of one of the lenses because we have a focus on overall employee satisfaction, ability to take time away from work. We wanted that to be a key item of, again, removing the reliance on memory where anyone can come in and really execute on a client close just based on what we the work we've put in to document those process and the software. I love that. And so now, now you're six months post a uh, uh, practice management system implementation, you know, after going mm -hmm. through a full list of maybe six to eight systems that we evaluated, we ended up landing on financial sense. And so now we're six mm -hmm. months in on, on that implementation. What's your, what are your thoughts now? Are we still iterating? Is there still change management occurring? Um, what does it look like after you've implemented the system? It's a great question. I think for my line of work, my, my, focus is always how can we be more efficient and and continually assessing pain points and inefficiencies. I feel really, really good about financial sense in serving our clients and their needs. And then I also feel really, really excited about the effort financial sense, the team, the company is putting into making their system better, listening to client needs, adopting new software trends, implementing AI. Um, so we're always tinkering with the new um, kind of the new evolution of what the software can provide and how we can make things better. Uh, I think it's checked all of the boxes that we have for how we're servicing clients. Um, but now we've identified a new pain point, right? In our overall workflow mapping and planning, we realized that the handoff between client scoping and, and signing in a contract, handing that data and what we promised, what systems the new clients using, handing that over to the actual client onboarding team, 
there's something broken there. So now we're going through the process. Do we need a software to solve this? Do we need a workflow change? Do, how do we kind of make this process overall a bit more seamless? The, the structure and the framework is all the same. You know, you're figuring out your workflow, figuring out the pain points, you're figuring out what objectives you wanna solve for, you're engaging stakeholders to make sure we're on the right path, doing research on how we wanna execute on change, and then eventually adopting a new way and, and committing to that. So the framework is all the same there, um, and it can be applied to a lot of different kind of rational decision-making processes. Um, and I think it's going to be something we, that sticks with us every six to 12 months minimum for how we make sure that we're always getting a little bit better and we're staying on top of trends and client needs and just as the business evolves. Yeah, I love the openness to change because ultimately in any growing firm, there will be change. And and at this juncture in our industry, there's a lot of change occurring on the tech front. And so we have to be very open to that. But to your point, by documenting out a process and having that core really well established, now we're just kind of bolting on to that core, to the practice management system, because we know that this is how we operate Mm -hmm. and we're creating efficiencies on top of that. We're not creating massive amounts of change again at this level. We're really just adding on to it and creating uh, better outcomes for our clients, for our team, and trying to move things forward in in the most manageable, efficient uh, way possible. You just reminded me of a really good point in the overall kind of software assessment. It goes back to the age old saying of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. (laughs) Right there with all of everything that we've said in this conversation today, it has to have the caveat of, you know, if there aren't pain points, don't change just to change. Right. That first item that we talked about was assessing workflow and identifying inefficiencies and pain points. Just because there's a flashier software that you think might have a prettier, you know, interface just because it's prettier, it doesn't mean it's solving for what's most important at your firm. So you really need to make sure you're solving for problems that exist, not just adopting new software for the sake of adopting new software. Because that can Drop be tricky, right? <laughs> yeah. Drop the mic. That's fantastic. Yeah, it, it, it is tricky. It, it's a very delicate, it's it's a difficult process to go through. But I think the way in which you've approached that is just very logical. It makes sense. And so I hope this has been beneficial for those firm runners out there to help help them think through how do you start to approach this type of of uh monumental potential change in 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 your firm. Um so thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And I think one of the most helpful things for me in the process was talking to people, talking to firm owners, figuring out what they like, what they don't like. If people are willing, doing a screen share, just see what the process looks like, see how it is in use. Obviously, there's good tutorials online that can always be helpful. But if you have a trusted network um, contact that you can talk to and willing to do a screen share, those are always really helpful. And uh, if you have questions of how we use Financial Sense, I'm always always willing to be an advocate and and talk through that and how our experience went. Perfect. And so if anybody wanted to find you, where would they find you and how they get a hold of you? I can mostly be reached on LinkedIn, LinkedIn slash Stacey Feldman CPA, um, linkedin.com slash Stacey Feldman CPA. Um, We also have our website, fullsendfinance.com. We can always be shut out there at howdy at fullsendfinance.com and um, would love to connect with anyone who's going through this process. Perfect. And I get the pleasure of riffing with Stacey Feldman on about a weekly basis on the Building in the Wild podcast. So if you want to hear more of us, you can jump over to Building in the Wild. But uh, Stacey, thank you so much for walking through uh, implementing a practice management system. This has been fun. Yeah. Happy New Year. And let's, let's make things more efficient. Yeah. Later. For listening in today, if you enjoyed this podcast, to share and write a review. This is going to help other firm owners just like you find our podcast and get insights into how to grow their firm. Stay tuned.